Okay, good morning, and welcome to Christian Bible Chapel, and we thank you for joining us this morning as the Lord bless you to be here to wake up this morning. Today, uh, this Sunday, this is the first Sunday of, uh, of March, and we thank and praise God. What we're going to do is continue our series of teaching and preaching from the subject at hand, the church. And we are at to the point that we're talking about the sacraments or the ordinances the church should be observing. Uh, for your benefit, I have put into a book form the complete uh, understanding of the sacraments. And it's a, uh, uh, let's see, it's 107 pages on the sacraments in a uh, reform perspective. I put it in a form. If you want a copy of it, uh, send me your address. No matter where you're at, I will send it to you. At, send me your address to Harris one at gmail.com, and I'll gladly send you a copy of, our, of, our, of this particular uh, lesson. Today we are looking at the sacraments, and we're going to review just a little bit from uh, last week that we may proceed on today. We're going to again be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, and a new verse, which is Romans chapter 4. Now, before we proceed, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessedness of your Holy Spirit, and, and that he, we know that he is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We pray, Father, that the power of the Holy Spirit may be upon all of our hearts as believers in Christ, especially as well as those that are not saved, that the unsaved may be brought under conviction through the power of his, his power and be saved, as well as those that are saved may be strengthened in the truth of the Word of God. Open our hearts, dear Father, as believers in Christ, and help us to fall away from our traditions, our upbringing, our religious affiliation and beliefs, and saturate ourselves in plainly the truths of the Word of God. We pray for wisdom, we pray for knowledge, and we pray for understanding that the power of your Spirit may lead us to interpret the Scriptures by the Scripture. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we get to the writing on the board here, I want to uh, read uh, uh, two or three statements concerning uh, the sacraments, okay? The sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace immediately instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm our interest in him as to put a visible difference between those that are unto the church and the rest of the world. Two, there is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between a sign and the thing it signifies. Three, the grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments rightly used is not converged by any power in them, neither does the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or the intention of him that does administer it, but upon the work of the Holy Spirit and the word of institution, which contains together with a precept authorizing the use thereof. Now, let me... Let me emphasize the third one, and, and, and I think that's where we left off from last week. We, we want to emphasize that the holy sacraments or the ordinances, let me read out, out the, the text that I, I said I quoted for you uh, earlier in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, Paul says to the churches, Be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. That's 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, verses 1 and uh, 2. Now, when we use the word sacrament, 
that it's the same word for mystery. All right? Now, I'm using the word sacraments because it's so familiar with a lot of people instead of the word ordinancy, but they both are the same. So if I switch in and say ordinancy or sacra sacraments, you do know what I'm talking about. Now, the, 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 the point of the matter is that, see, when we use the word sacraments in the church, especially in the Roman Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church, they're greatly used. They do not use the word ordinance, and it's, it's lost the sentence. But in number three that we talked about, some, even in the Protestant churches, which is not Roman Catholic, they feel to believe that when they ordain a man to the office of a minister, or when they baptize someone, you know, or when they take the Lord's Supper, they seem to think that something mysterious or something supernatural happens either to the to the, to the bread or the wine in the supper, or the water in baptism, or the anointing, what they do when they ordain a man to eldership. The Bible knows nothing about that. No power surges from God to the minister, to the person in, in, in ordaining. No power from God surges from God to the minister when they administer the Lord's Supper. Okay? No power from God surges from God to the minister when they baptize someone and then it surges to the water and cause the water to have some kind of supernatural effect upon the person that is baptized. Now I said that because it all began with that word sacrament or sacramentum. That's the Latin word. The, the Latin word, as far as in Jerome Latin Vulgate Bible, the Roman Catholic, it serves its meaning as meaning mysterion or mystery. And what the Protestant Church has grasped at in, from the Roman Catholic and thinking that something mysterious or something elusive happened in the water in baptism or with the bread and the wine that uh, we serve at the Lord's Supper or when a person, a man, is ordained into the ministry and the elders gather around and, 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 and lay their hands on the shoulder or the head of the, of, of the, of the man. No, no. The scriptures knows nothing about that. Sure, we do ordain men into the eldership. Yes, true, we do take the Lord's Supper with bread and wine. True, yes, we do baptize people. All right? And, but the thing, the point of the matter is we must move ourselves away from the understanding that something supernatural happens. Let me read that point again. I, 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 I want to heavily emphasize that before we move on. Here it is, number 30. The grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them. You see that? Neither does the efficacy of the sacraments, in other words, the power, the ability, all the grandeur of the Lord's Supper, of water baptism, these two sacraments, okay, right, depend, uh, uh, does not depend upon the piety or the intention of him, the person, the man of God, that institutes, that carries these two sacraments out in the church services. No power is given to us. And what I mean by that, I don't want to conflict what, what Jesus says, ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit come upon you, or in Matthew 28, 19. I, I'm, we're not talking about that. We are talking about how that an uh, elder who, who, who alone can minister the, Lord, the Lord's Supper and an elder who alone can baptize a person, he must not feel that 
scourging of power from the Holy Spirit rests upon him when he baptize the person in water or sprinkles or pour the water or whatever mode you use, nothing happens from the part of the Holy Spirit of God. Now the child of God may feel excited, may feel happy, may uh, uh, wave his hands, may laugh and smile and everything and give a testimony. That's all right, but that is not the productivity of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? Whether it's the Lord's Supper or the water baptism. We gotta understand that now. Okay? I thought I wanted to get that uh, over before we proceed on. Now, once again, let's turn to the board before we get to Romans chapter four. You might want to turn there while we were preparing our reading here on Romans chapter four. Now to you that are listening by video, we're gonna read it. To you that's look, looking and listening, uh, let's let's jot this down. If you let, let's get a piece of paper and carefully note what I'm going to read, okay? And then later on, uh, go to either YouTube or my 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 platform on Facebook, Sherman Harris, and and look at the video and you'll see it written out on the uh, uh, whiteboard, okay? So let's read, all right? Each epistle, each epistle by Paul, by Peter, by John, by, by, by Jude, by John, okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which is the Gospels, okay, they serve, especially the epistles, they serve as ordinances to the church as such and should be both read, studied, and observed. Because the epistles, it teaches us about the ordinances, which is only two now. It's only two ordinances. The Lord's Supper right, and water baptism. Within the compound of the epistles, within the compound of the epistles here, see, of the epistles, right, the ordinances are stressed, expressed, as well as greatly in the Gospels, because the Lord himself instituted the ordinances given unto the church, unto us. All right? Number one, the sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. All right? The sacraments are holy signs and seals. If there are signs and if there are seals, the sacraments are the ones. Not tongues, not miracles, not raising the dead supposedly, healing people, miracles, signs and wonders of a supernatural extraordinary, but the believer in Christ or the church itself looks towards the church sacraments, the church ordinances, because they are the signs and the seals of the covenant. Now, we're going to get an understanding of what the, we're going to take time and look at about this statement that I just made. It says they are the holy signs and seals. We're going to see in certain Romans chapter 4 and other passages of scriptures what we mean by that, okay? All right, number two, the sacraments, are given by Christ are the benefits of his mediation. Again, the sacraments given, they are given by Christ, all right, are the benefits of his mediation. So Paul made it so clear here, even in 1 Corinthians, you know, throughout Corinthians, he says, he says, uh, 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 kept, keep the ordinance as I delivered them unto you. That which was get revealed to me, see, even, see, even in chapter 11, okay, let me, let me jump further into chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, for I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, yeah. Jesus, while Paul was 
with Jesus being taught after he got his commission and God saved him and knocked him off the horse. You know the story. And he, God lured him, drove him into the wilderness, the desert, for a number of months, years, to be trained as an apostle. Okay? This is one of the things that Paul says, I was taught. So I, Paul says, what was delivered unto me, I delivered unto you. Keep the ordinances that I delivered unto you. Okay? This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So, but Christ is the originator of the sacraments, of the ordinances that we have in the church. The two, water baptism and the Lord's Supper. Sacraments, let me finish reading. Sacraments are given by Christ are the benefits of his mediation to strengthen and increase our faith towards or to obedience. That's what the sacraments, the ordinances, do to the believer, to the church, to the church. Okay? It strengthens strengthens and increase our faith to obedience. Okay? This is the reason why these ordinances need to be observed. As the church set about to maintain how it will be preserved in that it may the Lord's Supper may be preserved every Sunday, twice a month, right? Once a month, right? Every quarter, which is every three months, or on particular, uh, what we call as holidays, but they need to be observed. Okay? Water baptism, right? The person is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Number three, the Word of God and the sacrament are means of grace. They both share a common interest. The ordinances that we have in the church, okay, where it is the water baptism and the Lord's so, so, uh, Supper, they both serve, okay, they both, they, excuse me, I'm, I'm, let me rush, I'm rushing. I mean, the Word of God. I'm sorry. I apologize. The Word of God and the sacrament. So, the Word of God, which we have, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, and the two sacraments that we have, they have, they share a common interest. Both were instituted by God as a means of grace. Both point men to the person and the work of Christ. We're talking about the word and the sacrament. They both point people to the person and the work of Christ. They both can only benefit man if appropriated by faith. Both are applied to the heart by the Holy Spirit. Now, as we move from there, we see that the, uh, the, the point of matter is that the preached word right, must be preached in order for the observance of the sacraments. Right? The preached word must be preached in order to bring about the Lord's Supper. So when you take the Lord's Supper, the, the elder who presides, uh, must preach the word of God in a service as far as baptism before the person, the candidate is baptized the word of God again is preached the advantage that the word of God has over the sacraments is because you can preach the word of God often all the time and not commit the church commit themselves to the sacraments because the church may not 
baptized or may not take the Lord's Supper every time the word is preached. And that is, that, that's the difference there. Right? But, in the sacraments, when you do do the sacraments, the word of God has to be preached. Okay? So the word of God is absolutely essential and indispensable to salvation, but not to the sacraments. The sacraments, the Lord's Supper, and water baptism cannot save you. Yet, the word of God needs to be preached in order for the sinner to repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Okay? The Holy Spirit uses God's words both to produce strength, produce and strengthen faith, while the sacraments, as we already said, do it as well serves to strengthen and increase our faith. Right? So, the Word is the primary means of grace, while other means of grace are secondary to the Word of God. The Word of God, the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, defines the sacrament. It defines water baptism. It defines the Lord's Supper. So we need the Word of God. Right? We need the Word of God to be preached in its fullness, in its accuracy. The Word of God needs to be read, needs to be taught, needs to be preached, and studied. Right? And nothing is to be detracted or taken away from when you preach the word of God. Okay? And in the ordinances, it is the same thing. You cannot deviate from what Paul has said. And when we uh, commit ourselves to water baptism and the Lord's Supper, we cannot change it. We cannot uh, put in adjectives or substitutes. We have to do exactly what Jesus did. He took bread and he gave thanks and he said, take, eat, this is my bread. This is my body which is broken for you. You follow that? See, that's what we need to do. And this is what Paul said, I delivered it unto you. That first of all, the Lord Jesus, let me, let me let me, see, this is not my words, and, and this is the reason why we, we study scriptures, because scriptures interpret scriptures. Paul says, I receive of the Lord, that which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Right? He took bread, and that's what we got to use. Bread, not meat, not ox, not whatever you want to use, but you got to use bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Nothing else can substitute for the body that was crucified and atoned for sin. It was the body of Jesus Christ that was crucified on the cross. The bread represents that. Right? Then Paul says that after the same manner, he took the cup. Now, if you go back to Luke or Matthew 26 and Luke and uh, the, the gospel itself, they use wine. You can't substitute. You cannot substitute because the wine in the cup represent the blood that was shed for many. Without the shedding of blood, no removal, no remission, I should say, no remission, or forgiveness, the word remission means forgiveness of sin. You cannot substitute. You know, you cannot substitute other things. You got to use what Paul, what Jesus used, what Paul said Jesus used, and the church. That's the grandeur of taking the Lord's Supper properly.
Now we come to the point, and our time we're going to uh, spend the rest of our time. Let's turn to Romans chapter 4 as we uh, uh, look at this. There are two main aspects of the ordinances right, of this, the sacrament, okay? And that goes back to what we said in number one here, where it says sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Isn't it, it amazing how that the Lord God uses the Old Testament in his representation to bring about the New Testament. Old Testament, Old Covenant, Old Agreement, New Testament, New Covenant, New Agreement. Right? That which was, was old, how its significance can be applied to the new in a better way, a better covenant. Right? The Hebrew writer tells us that. Right? Now, let, let me read in Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4 concerning uh, the patriot uh, Abraham and how, how, how God blessed him and everything. Now we know that God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 uh, that he will be a blessing upon all nations in you all nations will be blessed. This is the starting point that it was already prophesied that every nation, every person, and what we mean by every na every person, it is the, the, the people within every nation, not everybody in the whole human family will be blessed and secured uh, because of Abraham, because that is not so. It was the elect within the, the uh, 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 Abraham. Okay, so we see here that what God did in Genesis chapter 15, 16, and 17 instituted towards Abraham the uh, what is known as circumcision. Circumcision is the cutting of the foreskin of the male sex organ, and it was done on the eighth day. It had to be done on the eighth day for medical reasons. And the point of the matter is Abraham received the promise before he was circumcised. And it was attested, or not attested, but it was confirmed even so after he was circumcised. Isn't it amazing? See, the point of the, see how marvelous God is? Suppose God gave Abraham the promise, and he said, all nations will be blessed by you, Abraham. Suppose Abraham was circumcised. Then that means that in order to fulfill the promise, everybody had to be circumcised. So when we come to uh, verse uh, chapter 4, all right, we see in uh, verse 9. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 9. It says, remember the blessing of the, of, of the promise now. We'll keep that in mind. Come this blessing then upon the circumcision only. See, the circumcision is the Jewish people under the law, the Jewish people, all right? Come, come this, this blessing is then upon the circumcision or upon the uncircumcised, or see. The uncircumcised people were Gentiles who knew not God. Now, what, what, what Paul was saying, that, see, Abraham was justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay? Nobody can be saved by the justification by the law or the deeds of the law or by the flesh, the law of works, or etc. Abraham believed God, and it was counted of him for righteousness, verse 2 and 3. Okay? He believed God. Okay? Right. So even as verse 6 it says, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. The word impute means to account or charge. Okay? Uh, that's why he says this, this, this blessing is, come this, he's asking a question there. He says, come this blessing uh, upon uh, the, uh, uh, upon the circumcision or only or upon the uncircumcision. 
verse 5. Verse 9. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now Abraham believed God. And God ensured to Abraham the promise of the blessedness. Okay? And within all that promise, that was compiled with that promise, it was given to Abraham. So the question is, is this blessedness of this promise, is it upon the, un, upon the circumcised, or the circumcision, which is the Jews, only, or is it upon the uncircumcision, which is the Gentile? All right, look at verse 10. How is it then it was reckoned then when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Was this, was this blessing that God poured out upon Abraham, was this accounted to Abraham when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? That's what verse 10, verse 10 is saying. And then it answers it. When he was in circumcision or uncircumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. See, Abraham wasn't circumcised when God gave him the promise. There's a point to where we're going to in this, and it's all dealing with the ordinances. Okay, watch this now. Okay, verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he, um, which he yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all that believe through faith. See, this is, this is, this is the wonders of God, how wonderful God is. Praise God. Right. So Abraham, as a man, was justified by faith because he believed in God. But he believed in God and he was justified when he was uncircumcised. See, the point of the matter is God intended to bring the Gentiles into the fold of salvation, into the blessings of God. It could have been halted if God had told Abraham to circumcise himself before he gave him the promise. But then the promise would be only to those who are circumcised. The greatness of God. Praise the Lord. Okay? Now, the point of the matter is that we're luring that Romans 4 is talking when we say the sacraments are holy signs and seals. Now, that was the Old Testament. When we come to the New, New Testament, circumcision is a prototype of what, what we as New Testament believers, when we commit ourselves okay, to water baptism and the Lord's Supper. Watch the connection here between the two. There are two aspects of the sacraments as signs and seals. These two aspects are taken directly from scriptures where circumcision is called a sign in the seal. Verse 11. See in verse 11? Let's read verse 11 again. Okay, let me get verse 11 and the NIV, see what it says. And Abraham received circumcision as a sign, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was yet uncircumcised. See, that's what verse 11 says. Right. Now, what does the Bible mean when it refers to the sacraments? The sacraments, the ordinances are what? What are the two ordinances? Right, okay. They are water baptism and the Lord's Supper. It refers to the fact that the sacraments are perceived by the senses of the body, especially by sight. Sensible signs are sensible signs are perceived by our physical senses. With the Lord's Supper, for instance, we have the bread and the wine. The bread and the wine are visible symbols. In communion, we see, we touch, we taste the bread and the wine. 
With baptism there is the pouring, the sprinkling, the immersion of water. The water is being sprinkled, poured, or immersed in upon the person who is being baptized. The, bat the, the person being baptized sees the water, feels the water, and in the water, the water is poured upon them, the water is sprinkled upon them, they endure the water. That's the whole point, enduring the water, enduring the eating of the bread, the drinking of the cup, signs and seals. So as signs, the sacraments have two elements. They are the external symbols. The Lord's Supper uses bread and wine. In baptism, we use water. Right? Again, when the minister, who is the only one, the elder, the minister, the evangelist, the pastor, who is the only one who can administer these sacraments, these ordinances, in these particular ordinances, when he administers, as we already pointed out to you in a statement, that nothing supernatural happens. Nothing surging happens from the power of the Holy Spirit into the body of the person and then to the person or the water or the bread and wine that causes the change. Only in the Roman Catholic Church and other religion systems, religious systems, does they 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 in, they insist on transubstantiation. And what that word means is when they do take the mass. When they do take the Lord's Supper outside of the Roman Catholic, they call it the Mass, the bread and the wine changes. It does not change you. You're still eating bread. You're still drinking wine. What it allures to is that the bread and the wine, the bread represents the body, the, the sacrificial body of Jesus dying on the cross for sin. The wine represents the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sin. Nothing changes. The water does not change in the pool, in the tub, in whatever the water is in. Yet neither does the bread or the wine changes. It's still bread and wine when you eat and drink. It's still water when you get in it and when you come out of it. See, what has happened to the church is we have picked up mythology and mysticism in our services. And this is why Paul says, you know you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols even as you were led. So with the Corinthians, when they came from worshiping Zeus, when they came from working, worshiping Bacchus and, and Aphrodite and Diana, they tried to bring that same stuff of religion into the church. That's why Paul says, know the spirit of Christ from the spirit of the world, the devil, and demons. No man can say that Jesus is Christ except by the Holy Spirit. Demons will not admit to that. The flesh will not admit to that. World system of religion won't admit to that. So Paul was counteracting the falsehoodness of God's demons and flesh and systems in his, in his life, in his time, as well as we do today. People bring in their systematic method of worshiping and religion. Wherein Jesus says to the woman at the well, you don't know what you're worshiping. God is a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. In Ephesians, in Ephesus, there was the god Diana as well as the god Bacchus. Now Bacchus, Bacchus was one of the gods that super that that super false, of course it's false, that said in order to believe in him, all right, he 
will bless your crops. He will bless the fruits and vegetables. He will give you everything. But in order to worship Bacchus, you have to get yourself in a drunken stupor, have orgies, and be indulged in sexual immorality to please the god Bacchus. That was in the days of Paul in the Roman days. There's plenty of gods. Okay. But this particular god says, no, you got to get drunk and high. You, you got to, you know, get high and drunk and everything like that and get uh, and sexual uh, and every, all that in order to please him. And this is the reason why Paul says in Ephesians, he says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. See, Barkus says, no, you got to do this to be, uh, to, 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 to worship the gods. Paul says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, no, no, you worship God in spirit and truth, you have to be controlled by the Spirit of God. See the difference? So, the, the, the Greeks brought their stuff into the church, and that's the, the epistles have to, they, they battle that falsehoodness which, which crept into the church. Right. Now, when we look at the, the, the external symbols of each of each uh, ordinances that was given to the church as, 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 as water baptism and the Lord's Supper. All right, you see, as I already said, that the bread and the wine is the, uh, you know, symbolizes what Jesus died on the cross, his blood, his, his, his blood that was shed, his body that was crucified. Wherein the water itself, you know, has its own representation and symbol also. That's why we say that the sacraments are holy signs and seals. Now, next week, Lord's willing, we're going to pick up some more on the um, the sign aspect, but then we're going to flow right through and talk about how that the ordinances that Christ has given us, whom the epistle speaks of, the word of God, are sealed. And we're still in Romans chapter 4 and other passages of scriptures. Let's look to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for the blessing of, of the word of God. We thank you, Father, that through and by through the word of God, we may have an understanding of the scriptures. If we only relate the scriptures to the scriptures, tear us away from our traditions. Those traditions that is not following the word of God help us, O oh God, to forsake it. Those teachings, those thoughts, those whatever it may be, our upbringing, our affiliation, Lord, help us to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us by his spirit as he teaches us the scriptures by the scriptures. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Now, also next week we're going to look. Is also, we're going to start also dealing with what baptism is and everything as well as the Lord's Supper. God bless.